All right, so good morning, everybody. Uh, assume that the uh, two victims of night are for you in here in the lecture. So it's um, my great pleasure to welcome our first uh, lecturer speaker this morning, uh, Professor Justin Williams. He's at the University of Aberdeen and uh, the Royal Aberdeen Children's Hospital in Scotland, where he's a senior lecturer in uh, child and adolescent psychiatry. Uh, so his background, obviously, is in medicine. He's an MD with specialization in psychiatry. As we will learn today, certainly in detail, uh, his work is on uh, mechanisms of autism, and he worked a lot on neural mechanisms of imitation, uh, empathy, and mirror neuron systems in autism spectrum disorders. So we're very welcome. We look very much look forward to your talk, Justin. Thanks thank for coming. Thank you very much. Um, oh, there we go. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me here today. It's a pleasure. It's my first trip to Barcelona <laughs> as well, so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing some of the city. Um, Okay, I'm going to talk today um, about the research I've been doing really for the last 10-15 uh, years. Um, and that's trying to uh, understand the, uh, the, the, the mechanisms of social learning uh, in autism. Um, one, of, one of, just, just to give you a little perspective um, on, on my background is that I took a little bit of time out from medicine about some time ago to study ecology um, and behavioral ecology, and e which led me to an interest in evolutionary psychology. And I worked with uh, a guy called Andrew Whiten, who is actually known for his work on imitation in primates. And he was the one who sparked my interest in the role of imitation um, in social learning. So whilst he was, has been working very hard on mechanisms of imitation in uh, non-human primates, I've been interested in the role of imitation in humans um, and, in, and in child development. So today I'm going, to, I'm going to, first of all, bring us back to what is autism, what's autism about, and why, hopefully, I think that imitation is so important. And we'll come down to it, but it will start off with the, uh, discussing what the key issue is, the key science problem is in autism. Um, and then I'll go on to looking more at the reasons why, at the way that we, the, the, the sorts of actions that are important um, when, we're, when we're studying the, 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 the science problem of autism, if you like. And um, a lot of the research in this area has been very cognitive. Um, if we take a, uh, this sort of dichotomy of cognitive versus emotional, then, um, then I would say that a lot of the research in this area has been cognitive, and I'm trying to, be, trying to look at it in, um, in a slightly different light. And have gone on to look at the uh, imitation and the cultural transmission of emotionally meaningful behaviour. So we're going to, I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, I'm not going to talk much about technology, about, about the, the, the hard uh, physical side of it, and, um, but hopefully we can discuss that and discuss your interests in it. Um, so just to kick off then, um, what, is, what is the science problem of autism? A lot of people have different notions of what autism is. Um, and there were people tend to have their sort of stereotypes. Either it's the brilliant mathematical savant, or it's the uh, it's the child who's mute and nonverbal. Autism is a hugely variable um, disorder. Um, and but what's sort of remarkable is that the instruments that we use to diagnose it, in particular, I'll talk about the, uh, the ADOS and the, uh, the ADI, which is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule and the Autism Diagnostic Interview. These instruments, which we use to diagnose it, apply across the board from children who, from aged one up to age 99 plus, um, across all ages, um, and across all levels of IQ, from severely learning disabled to, um, you know, mathematical genius level. Um, so what is it? What are the actual things that make autism, that make us recognise somebody as having autism as distinct from having uh, other disorders, uh, things that DCD is developmental coordination disorder, um, 
ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, anxiety, learning disability. Um, one of the important aspects, one of the important things about autism is its developmental condition. That means it's present from a very early age and it changes with development. It, the clinical picture will change as you get older, as you develop language. And, you know, having Asperger's, having autism is not the same as being geeky or uncool or just dressing badly. Um, but we are going to talk a little bit about how culture, which is the critical part of social behaviour, culture is behaviour which is transmitted from one person to another effectively. It's, a, it, it's socially transmitted behaviour. Um, and that might be something that's critically impaired in autism. So primarily, autism at a very simple level is a combination of repetitive behaviours and social impairment. But if we look specifically at the features about the things that we're really interested in, if we're going to diagnose autism, then what we see is an enormous emphasis, an enormous uh, on, on the use of action. So we talk about, I'm not sure if this is working. Here we go, yeah. Okay, so we see that a lot of the diagnostic I, the, lots of the items which are used in the diagnosis of autism reflect the use of action in social behaviour. So we look at eye contact, we look at <laughs> smiling, particularly not just smiling but social smiling, smiling in response to another person smiling or smiling at somebody, not just smiling but smiling at somebody. Um, we look at facial expression, the range of facial expression, whether or not it's appropriate we're interested in what's called declarative pointing. That is, if I point out something and say, hey, look over there, and then I look at you, and I look back at the object, and then I look to see if you're looking at what I'm pointing at, that's declarative pointing. It's not the same as I want that. Um, conventional gest use of gestures in conversation. I mean, I tend to flap my hands quite a bit. We have all sorts of different forms of gesture. We have descriptive gesture. We have emphatic gesture, um, we have uh, instrumental gesture. Um, we've got whether you nod or head, shake your head, showing and directing attention, as I say, that sort of comes within the pointing. Um, using somebody else's body to communicate, that's an interesting symptom that I, of where, whereby one might actually make the other person perform certain actions. Um, and again, the quality of social overture, the way that you integrate all of those nonverbal behaviours in, in approaching somebody. The area of, 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 of imagination in autism is impaired, not just, I mean, you'll find that people with autism have very good imaginations. There's nothing wrong with their imaginations if you're asking them to imagine things which don't include actions. They tend to have very good, uh, you know, can have fantastic visual spatial skills if you ask them and, and, and you'll see somebody paint a beautiful picture which doesn't actually have any people in it. Um, in the, 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 the area where imagination tends to be affected is when one person is trying to read another person's actions or when one is using another figure to do actions, so particularly using a doll as an agent. Um, so and making that perform certain actions. Um, so we'll, we'll, the, the other side of autism is are these issues here, which are not so much, which are really about social motivation, uh, social verbalisation, how you respond to other people, making friends, um, being thoughtful about others, and social understanding, um, that bit about following somebody else when you're having a conversation, listening to what they say and responding to them. Um, what's very interesting for me is how these things all link up. Are these issues of gesture related and imagining action related to social motivation and social understanding? What sort of problem in the brain might underpin both? So this is just a slide to show you how as 
language develops over time or with development, then what one act tends to see is that the, the, the emphasis, different, different aspects of those spectrum of symptoms come into play. So really, um, in the younger children, we see the majority is based on action-based communication, the use of that child's ability to use actions that have a meaning attached to them. And that slightly tends to diminish over time and the language-based communication increases. So if you're looking at um, a, a verbally able adult, then you're relying much more on those language-based symptoms, that things like conversation, appropriateness of social response, um, than you are at an early age. And just to illustrate how that, what I mean, um, if we go back to the ADOS, which is called the, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, if any of you have ever, if ever you have any, uh, do any work with people with autism, you'll find that the, uh, there's a very, in science there's a, a desire, this is the desirable way for you to diagnose autism. Um, it's not the only way, um, it's just quite often you'll find the reviewer comes back and says, you know, why hasn't this person been diagnosed with an ADOS? Um, so it's the widely accepted way of diagnosing autism. And it's, it's a pr process by where you sit in the room with the, the person who, and you do have a videotaped interaction where you basically try and make them exhibit social behaviours. And what you see is you go, you've got different modules. You've got a pre-verbal module. You've got somebody who has just phrased speech, somebody who has fluent speech, and then uh, an adolescent and, and fluent, verbally fluent adult. And you'll see that the emphasis um, in the algorithm changes as you get older. Um, and in the pre-verbal child, then we are interested in, as I mentioned, declarative pointing, the use of gestures, the use of facial expressions, showing behaviours, hey, come and have a look at this, uh, asking behaviours um, and reaching. I mean, for example, if they, we, we have this thing where, you know, you have a toy and you hold it out of reach. Um, and when do they just go up and grab it off you? Or do they actually look at you and do they make some sort of movement with their eyes, with their coordinated actions that say, please, can I have that? And the other side of this is repetitive sensory and motor behaviours. So it's almost the default. If you don't engage in those social behaviours, you see um, repetitive and sensory and motor behaviours, which are simply usually behaviours which are simply directed at getting a sensory reward. Um, and as we uh, as we begin to get a bit older, these things, these actions continue to play a part throughout development. Even in the adolescent and adulthood, we are still looking at the range of facial expressions. We're still looking at the use of gesture. Notice that as we start off, the gestures get a little bit more, um, the, the, the gestural abnormality in autism can get a little bit more subtle. So quite often in the adult, we're looking at the use of emphatic gestures. So that's, um, you'll find that the person with autism uh, will often, an adult high functioning person will often use descriptive gestures, but what they won't do is beat their hands to the beat of their speech. And that becomes a discriminative thing. Um, so we see as we get, we see the language coming into play um, as we get older, um, more, more um, thoughtful, more giving thought to others. Primarily, though, that is developed. You can see that these, the, the, these com conversations, social abilities, are uh, developing on top of the, um, the actions. Now, how do we develop? So how do we, how do we develop? How do we, where do these actions come from? Where do these asking behaviours, these showing behaviours, these gestures, these facial expressions, are they innate? or are they learned? Are they learned by looking at other people? And there's quite a sort of one it's a pretty strong hypothesis that they're learned. They're learned by looking at other people. We learn actions by copying others. And imitation is a very important part of our social development. Um, so 
it's been a long-standing question, probably since almost the earliest days when autism was first described as to whether imitation um, was a problem in autism. Um, the explanation for imitation problems, or the, in fact the hypothesis of impaired imitation in autism, has been there since, um, has, has always had come from a different background. So in the very first days there was a psychoanalytic um, idea that uh, imitation was important. In fact, prior to that there was Piaget and he thought imitation was important for social <laughs> development. We had a psychoanalytic explanations for imitation in autism. Then we moved on to neuropsychological explanations with Sally Rogers in 91. She was actually the person who probably wrote the most comprehensive model of how imitation was uh, central to autism. And then when mirror neurons came along, I jumped on the bandwagon and said, hey look, mirror neurons are important for imitation and theory of mind and might be underpinning autism. But over that time, there's been a lot of studies um, looking at imitation in autism. And there is, as you can see, this is a meta-analysis that was published just a couple of years ago. Um, this black line here would mean that there's no effect, uh, no group difference at all. And all of these studies here, nearly all of the studies you can see are to the left of that line, indicating that there is nearly always an effect. And usually if you look at those studies where there's not been an effect, you find it's because they've used inappropriate control groups. Uh, they, the, the, the classic mistake is not to use age-matched control groups, but to use language-matched control groups. <coughs> and then those studies tended not to find an effect. But overall, there's an effect size of about nearly a, nearly a whole standard deviation. So there's no question about the fact that there are imitation problems in autism. But that could be for all sorts of reasons. We can't necessarily, because we've got a correlation, it doesn't mean causation. Imitation is not necessarily going to be the cause of the social impairment. Very early on, I mean, if you look at Asperger's original descriptions of his cases, he showed that all of his kids had very poor coordination abilities, particularly handwriting. Handwriting, dreadful. So it might just be that, you know, if you've got a develop, if you've got a brain development problem, perhaps there's a non-specific effect on imitation is due to um, requires a lot of different cognitive functions. So perhaps imitation is just part of a general motor control problem. Um, it's not necessarily uh, of any relevance, you know, of any particular importance. Alternatively, it may be critical. It may be that autism is about that there is this problem associating actions and motor skills with their sort of socio-emotional meaning and that particular impairment may be the critical link between imitation and the, uh, and the development of autism. So that's essentially our hypothesis, that a failure to develop representational capacities of action explains the problems then with developing empathy and other social cognitive function, as well as imitation. So that's the, that's the challenge for us to explore. We need to be able to show that imitation problems, so the, the imitation problems are uh, present even when we have controlled for all these other possible factors. So I'll tell you about, first experiment I'm going to tell you about is one where we compared imitation with what's called object movement reenactment. So in object movement reenactment, the you don't actually have to copy the action. You don't have to look at the action itself. You can just copy the end point. And the example, the, 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 the person who invented, first used it experimentally, Celia Hayes, um, talked about, you know, the old haunted house where the piano plays itself. Now, could you learn to play a piano from watching a piano playing itself? I mean, you 
it's a bit of an odd, you're going to play, learn to play the piano differently. But effectively, you see what I mean? The action, the, you imagine the piano playing itself and you can then imitate that. You don't have to actually watch the hand movements. So, um, the second thing is that um, we have always, in the past, when we've been doing these, all these imitation studies in autism tend to use what's called the do-as-I-do method. They, you see somebody carrying out an action, and then you say, right, now you do it. And then somebody who's a blind judge says, well, I think that was a good copy of that action. I don't think it was a very good copy. It depends upon what you're looking at. It depends upon what you actually specified um, you needed to do. It's a very much a subjective judgment as to whether or not the imitation was good or not. And what I wanted to do was using kinematic technology was to actually measure the relation. Let's take a parameter of the modeled action and we'll measure it and then we'll measure the uh, imitated action and we'll see how close they were. So I went on to develop uh, that sort of methodology um, and then we uh, carried out this study with um, a group of young male adolescents with um, autism in Aberdeen um, along with 26 controls. They're all aged between 11 and 17 and they all had an IQ in the normal range. We gave them the social response, the SRS is social responsiveness questionnaire. It's a sort of measure of, it's a parent, parents fill in the questionnaire and it rates the severity of the autism. We measure IQ um, with the Weschler. We measured, uh, we actually measured motor skill and then we looked at these copying measures. So um, just to show you what that is. Now, how am I doing this? Is I think we okay. So here's the imitation condition, and what you see is that you can only see hmm, you can only see the action. You can't actually see what he's drawing on the pad. You can only see the you can only see the action. Okay. Now if we move on, and in this one, hmm, whoops, sorry, <laughs> oh dear, right, let me just try something. Oh dear, I must apologise, I've got two of the same video. Okay, so in the second video, the guy does not actually move at all. He stays completely still, rigid, looking down. And he... Uh, and what you see is you see the um, a line appearing on the screen. Well, you see a, a dot appearing on the screen. Um, and the dot moves in exactly the same. So we actually recorded the movement... Um, recorded the kinematics of the movement and then we replayed that movement. So they're exactly the same two sets of motor tasks. We then say to the participants, right, you now copy that, draw it again. And what we've done is we change the speed at which they're drawing and we change the shape, we change the size of the shape. So we ask them to copy the size and the speed at which it's being drawn. Um, and then we measure the uh, and then we're looking at differences and essentially um, yes 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 so it's exact yeah exactly the same yeah okay um, except we have done it in the scanner as well in which case they have a, a screen which we made specially um, so first of all, there's, a very, there's quite a large effective group, okay? So the, um, that is both the, the people with autism perform pretty badly on this task. They perform much less accurately. Um, what we, um, here we're looking at 
yeah, we, 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 we basically, we're measuring error. Um, we can measure the root mean squared error. So basically you can draw a line and when we measure the absolute difference between um, the two. So there's, first of all, there's a large group effect. But then the, um, the, 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 the more interesting thing is that there's a, there's a significant interaction. So the, um, whilst the, the autism group performed pretty badly um, on both, they perform even worse on the imitation. Um, so we do find that there is actually a specific impairment of imitation that you cannot then explain by really any, you can't explain it through attention, you can't explain it through memory, you can't explain it through motor control. Those demands are, are made the same. So there's a specific effect of, um, of group on, on, um, of autism on imitation. Notably, um, something to say is that that's specific to path length, the path length error. We didn't find it with speed. Um, looking at the data, it looks as if the issue with path length is that actually you really do have to copy the action. So can I ask another question? Yeah, sure. Um, well, you would, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so just seeing the dot is, oh, is good enough. Yeah, I mean, in fact, if you, if you were to do it, you probably think that the dot is a bit easier. So I, it's a shame I haven't got the videos here, but the, in some ways, the dot is a bit easier because you... Yeah, you haven't got to. You haven't actually got to infer it from the movement. So I have a <coughs> basic question regarding the task. So I'm watch if I'm a subject, I'm watching the video, and then I have to reproduce the triangle. Are the subjects instructed that the path length is actually important? Because naively watching this guy drawing the triangle, I would be happy with reproducing a triangle of any size. It was not clear to me that the pass length is actually yeah. critical. No, we do say copy the form, the size, and the speed of the action. That's, that's the, there's an ex explicit phrase. We want you to copy form, size, and speed. I haven't gone into the measures of how we've looked at form, whether they did copy the triangle or and circle and speed, but... turning around and uh, when it comes to the size, like you can see the, the shape, but um, I would think that uh, reproducing the size by watching this video and not an overhead video would be more difficult. Yeah, that's what, that's what we suggested in the paper, exactly. <laughs> so I think that it's, it's a perspective reversal problem. You have got, you've got to, th that's in a way the difficulty with that imitation task is that you've only got the action, you've got to reverse the perspective. With the, with the speed of action bit, you can actually just estimate the time that it took. You know, it doesn't actually require any of that sort of perspective reversal. And that's why I think we don't see, perhaps why we don't see a, a, a group difference with the speed problem. Okay. Um, so it's just some other, so similarly, we, we looked at correlation. We find that there's a, a correlation with the SR with severity. Unfortunately, not actually within the group. This is when we've merged two groups. Um, we see that there's uh, a correlation between autism severity and, as I say, again, error on both tasks. But if we do a linear regression, then we see that if we control for the object movement reenactment error, we still see a significant correlation with SRS um, on the imitation task. Okay, so just to summarize that part, this is evidence, imitation and OMR, they're both impaired in autism. So there are, you know, there are motor control problems, um, no question about that, but there's an additional impairment when it comes to imitation. So that's 
providing um, some evidence for an imitation-specific deficit in autism. Okay, what about uh, facial imitation? Um, okay, so as I said to you, the, the doing all this work, everybody's busy trying to look at these very uh, mo these, these motoric processes, thinking about imitation, but it occurred to me this wasn't really very ecologically uh, valid. You know, where does copying shapes, drawing shapes, map onto the, 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 the problem that we see, the day-to-day the, the -day problems we see in autism, which are about the imitation, about use of social communication, learning how to communicate feelings effectively and in a culturally appropriate fashion. Um, so I've been interested in facial expression. Facial expression is another motor skill. Um, perhaps not one that we tend to think of as a motor skill, but it actually, as I'll show you, is a highly developed skill that, we, that most people have and it's under very subtle control. It's the main means by which we communicate our emotional states. And very curiously, it's almost completely unresearched. Now, I'm, you might point at a lot of studies looking at it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to come on to this later on, but um, what you tend to find out is two things in most of the research involving imitation of facial expression. First thing is that people tend to use stereotyped expressions. Now, copying a stereotyped expression, taking an expression, taking any motor action, and then utilizing an already existing motor action in your own repertoire, and then executing that. That's not really imitation. Imitation is about looking at something and then recreating it. It's then looking at something and copying it from seeing how it's done. So most of the time people just say, right, can you copy that expression of happiness? Can you copy that smile? Can you copy that anger? And you then just make the angry face, we just make the happy face. So I'm talking about something which is look, going to be a little bit more subtle. Now there's two, two existing methods for measuring imitation, as I said to you earlier. There's, well, there's one usual way is the do as I do method, where you present a series of trials and you say, right, copy, you can change the character of the action that you present and you can then measure how, pe how well people um, can replicate the particular thing which you varied. Um, the other way is something called the two-way method and so uh, in, 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 the, in the big debate about whether or not chimpanzees have culture, <laughs> non-human primates have culture, the accepted method of testing whether or not imitation is occurring is to present two ways. Typically is, the, um, is what's called the artificial fruit, which is a box containing um, a reward. And there are two ways of opening the box. You know, you might turn the key or you might pull the rod out and you show the two ways. You show one way to one group and you show the other way to the other group. And then you look at it, see if they open the box in the way that they've been shown it. So for this purpose, I've sort of combined these two methods by saying, well, let's take a series of facial expressions. We wanted to have a look at how well people could copy a series of facial expressions so we could change the expressions in some systematic way by changing the predetermined parameters. And then we can see how well people can discriminate between the different facial expressions when we asked in, in their attempts at imitation. Um, it's probably, uh, yeah. So we have something called the feast triangle. Um, there are six basic expressions and they are uh, on the tri triangle according to their similarity. So happiness is most closely similar to surprise. Uh, surprise is most closely similar in appearance I'm talking about to fear, fear to sadness, sadness to disgust, disgust to anger. And so the three most dissimilar expressions, happiness, disgust and fear, form one triangle. 
and anger, surprise and sadness form another triangle. We then put them into what we'll call three-dimensional face space and I'll show and create this series of blends. So what we've done is, um, this is working with David Perrett's uh, lab in St Andrews in Scotland, um, who has, you may have come across him as being very uh, well known for his work on morphing facial expressions. Um, and what you see is here, you'll see here's, uh, this is the surprised, angry, sad. And what you'll see is if you look at any two expressions, then you'll see that they're actually, say that one and that one, or that one and that one, they're all quite similar to each other when they're adjacent because they're blends and the amount of each, the proportion of each one of these basic emotions in the blend is determined according to its distance from the, from the origin, if you like. So you'll see that gradually morphs from one expression into the other, gradually morphs into that expression, gradually morphs into that expression, and these are um, blends of all three. Um, so what we've got is a series of facial expressions which we can then ask people to imitate as closely as they can. We can then take their photographs and try and map, get somebody who's blind to look at them and say, well, can you tell which expression modelled which? And somebody who's got very good at facial imitation can give a very clear repertoire of facial expressions like that. But for somebody who's very poor at facial imitation, then you can't tell which expression matched with which. So that's basically the idea. So we showed the participants the stimuli on a computer screen whilst we filmed them with a webcam. Um, we showed them each stimulus and then we asked them to imitate the facial expression. We took all the photos, we collected them, we printed them out and then one person labelled the back. I'm explaining the way that we did it manually because it's probably the easiest way to understand it. We've uh, speeded this up since. Then the second person tried to match the photos to the, to the model images and then we unblind it and we count how far each expression is from in steps. So if you think of this, if say this person uh, copied this expression here, but when they copied it, the person who was rating it placed it down here, then that would be two steps away. Um, if they just got that one, put it down there, that would be one step away and so on. So we also then measured um, their empathy traits using the uh, empathy quotient question. It's a nice, straightforward, simple self-report measure of empathic traits. Um, we had just in this original study, just 24 participants um, and we had two people rating them. Now, interesting people obviously say, well, isn't it the raters? It's the person who's judging them. But actually, we can get very close correspondence between the raters, so the actual variation, the, the raters are also constant in this. So actually the variability is generated through the participants. Um, and one of the things was that people are remarkably good at this task. Um, individual performance is very strong and, you know, 49% of photos were just one step out. Um, and actually um, over a third of them were actually correct. So considering how similar the, some of those facial expressions are to one another, um, people do remarkably well. They also do e better on one than the other, um, and I haven't quite worked out why that is yet. So what was um, nice first of all though, was this finding that the imitation accuracy or the imitation, in fact this is the imitation error score, um, correlated with the empathy quotient. So here we've got the empathy quotient is a measure of your sociability, it's not a behavioural measure, I mean it's a behavioural measure, it's a self-report measure of how 
easily you find social situations, how well you manage social situations, how much you think you can understand other people. And here we have a completely behavioural measure, and I believe it's the first actual sort of direct behavioural measure of, of, of empathy. And there we find is correlating. Now we've repl replicated that three or four times now. Um, so it's not just a, a, a one-off. And here we're seeing it really quite small numbers. I mean, this is only with 24 participants. Um, so uh, we've got a nice relationship between imitation ability and, and empathy. Um, now, that could be mediated by a capacity for sensory motor control over facial expression when expressing feeling states. Um, and that might be, I'll come, perhaps come back to this later, is the question of uh, theory of mind um, and how much that reflects the ability when you see a face, you're going to imitate it offline, so to speak. Um, but other possibilities, is it, is it simply an ability to recognise and encode emotional expressions? Is it to do with social motivation and the keen to do, keen to do well? It might have just been people's uh, attendance to the task. So those are things that we need to look at. Um, the, uh, since then, we've done a similar study in people with autism. And you probably won't be surprised to find that we find really quite highly significant um, group effects um, and well, on, on both triangles. But surprising again, much stronger effects with the HFD, with the Happy Fear Disgust triangle, than with the SAS triangle. But we don't find that there are any group differences with the emotion recognition. So... Um, and if you look at the literature on emotion recognition or in, in autism spectrum disorder, you find there is pretty well, there is a small effect. You need a large number of people and you do find a small effect size. This emotion recognition was that we showed in this task, we showed them the same stimuli that they've used to imitate. And we said, say, what's the predominant emotion in each of these stimuli? Um, and um, yeah, we find there's no, no, no group difference. So I don't think that emotion recognition ability can explain performance on this task. Um, note again, we also on this study found a strong correlation with the SRS. We found a strong correlation with self-report and parent report on the EQ. We didn't find, I don't know if any of you have come across the systematizing quotient, uh, which is Baron Cohen's sort of complementary measure, but we didn't find any effect on that. And we didn't find, we found a very, an almost significant effect of IQ up here, um, but no effect of age. Surprisingly, no effect of age. And we have replicated this um, in children as well. Okay, so... Um, for those of you who are interested in technology here, um, I'm just gonna, we, we've, we've started to try and make this an automated process um, because what has occurred to us is that actually um, this business about rating, well, it's one thing, it was, we, it's quite time consuming, um, although it's turned out to be a lot more time consuming to try and new, generate a computer uh, vision measure. Um, but um, we've, we, it, it's time to me, it, it, if, we could, if we could automate it, then one thing is that we've got an actually an automated measure of, uh, of empathic traits. Um, and secondly, we could take out that subjective element uh, of the task. So we started to look at how, wh whether we can automatize it. Um, and basically we do the same, we've, but this time, we, we've, we've changed the paradigm, so we've speeded everything up. People only get a few seconds to do each expression, and it goes neutral to expressive, neutral to expressive, sort of like that. Um, we then take a, uh, uh, several minutes of video of just constant videoing of the expressions. And at each expression, we take the first three frames and then the first last three frames. Um, we use automated face detection uh, methods and we then use local feature 
selection, which are automatically placed uh, markers. And this is actually uh, my, is my postdoc who, who was doing this, and he intentionally chose somebody with glasses and a beard just to, just to make it difficult and show that it still worked, even when we had glasses and a beard. Um, we then summate the symmetric, so there's, we, 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 we measure, we're measuring movement vectors of each of the features of facial expression. We remove the redundant features, i.e. the ones that never move, and so we're just left with the eye, the eyebrow, the facial edge, and the mouth, and we then look at each one of those as movement vectors. And so what we've basically got from each one is a generation, uh, a matrix of weighted vectors. We then can imagine that the task, if you like, if you could think of each one of these emotions as colours, and that can give you a sense that, there's, that, that each one of these faces is a sort of a blend of the three colours, and they should mer blend into one another. Um, and we can then extract from each face what the, what the vector is, and then we can compare the vector fit to the model, um, versus the vector fit to the control array. And what uh, we came up with the first time was very successful. Um, unfortunately, we are still working on this. I haven't managed to replicate it very well, but hopefully we're on the way there. If anybody is interested in this and wants to, um, would be interested in pursuing it at all, we, um, we now have everything online. We have the experiment online. Um, and we can, um, so it can be accessed from anywhere. Um, the only, uh, and then we can collect the data, and then we've got a, um, uh, at the moment we've also got, a, we're still using the manual method, and we can, you can, um, we've got some software to, to do that as well. Um, so that's just to show if it, the, the, the direction that we're going in with that. Um, Okay, so that's facial imitation. Um, anybody got any questions on that? We'll move on to the next wee bit. <coughs> Um, at the moment, in terms of the com in terms of the computer analysis. In terms of the automated computerized approach, do you mean? Yeah, it's because it seems to me that expression is the way you move from one point to another. If you have a set representation of one point in time, you're not going to take the expression. I, I, I think uh, uh, it's much better to have a <coughs> uh, the way the points change in time to get expression. You know what I mean? Yeah. What we, what we, I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, I think you're, you're right. Um, the one of the sort of critical things that we've found is it's, it's actually, and the difficult thing when you're doing this um, in a in a computerized, automated way, is that it's actually the individual variance. It's it's the it's a variance within an individual. So an individual having a repertoire, and you you can't actually map the points accurately. So one person's smile, he, you know, everybody has their own smile and they have their own shape of face and they have their own facial identity. And that really sort of confounds any attempts to try and map one point movement onto another person's one point movement. Exactly because of this that I think the matching has to be like a dynamic system. It's not a static. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, well, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are different curves of change. Yeah, there are different curves, and that's that's another problem, which uh, we which which we have on the list, but we have shown yeah uh, with the autism, with the people with autism, they have very slow responses, yeah. and the the people the controls appear to be very quick at doing this. They can immediately. Now, I mean, in the presentation of stimuli, we only have one static and one, one active. And 
again, I'm looking at doing a dynamic presentation, but it probably wouldn't make a lot of difference because it's so fast that it's actually, you infer the movement anyway between the static and the end photo. Does that get, yeah? Is the instruction to the subject reproduce the look of the other face as good as possible? So uncover your teeth and close your eyes or not and uh, do something with the corner of your mouth? Or is the instruction to reproduce the emotion of the template as precisely as possible? So do they imitate the muscular pattern? Yeah, we don't say we don't say specific. I mean, I think we just say, please, you know, copy this facial expression as closely as you can. Um, I don't. We certainly don't say, you know, make the same facial movements or or, or anything. We just say, copy this facial expression. Would be that they can actually detect the emotion of well, the template, but they cannot produce on demand the emotion. These are these are questions which we are. Um, these are questions which we're trying to. I mean, at the moment we've got this lovely correlation, and I'm very interested and in, and in, and still trying to figure out how to answer that that question. Is you know, do is is it that the people who are empathic use an emotional imagination to help them with the task? Do they infer the emotional state? I don't know. I mean, the answer is I don't know whether they infer the emotional state and that helps them do the task better, or is it to do with the level of motor control over the, over the facial expression that, is, is, that might be the fundamental thing, the, the fundamental issue in empathy? So. Yeah, but would be completely in the second step. Yeah, but look, the, the thing about the, the, the in a way the point about these stimuli is that they they're intentionally ambiguous. So you can't really go, I mean you look at that one or that one or even, you know, you, you, you look at these, you could not say what emotion that is. You can't label it. You might be able to you might be able to have yeah, but you, you, you couldn't actually, I mean, I couldn't, I don't know, say what is that. You might be able to, you might, it, it might give you a feeling, a mixed feeling of anger. Uh, what's that one? That was anger and surprise. That might give you a sort of a mixed state that would help you, but I'm not sure. So I think the answer is I don't know. Um, that's what I'm quite keen to find out, though. Okay, um, so um, this is moving on to a different, um, a slightly different topic um, in which I, all this time I've been working on these sort of mirror neuron ideas, um, these, these questions of motoric uh, relationships between motoric ability and uh, or, or sort of action representation and um, uh, and social cognition, and um, it occurred to me that nobody had really. Uh, I thought, well, what about asking people? Um, you could actually ask people how much they they use nonverbal behaviour. You know, look around you. Um, you see within the typical population, some people are very expressive in their faces. They use a lot of gesture. Um, they um, and you see other people who have very sort of wooden abilities, don't tend to use actions a lot. Um, is there a way, and is there, is there a, somehow a sort of a dimensional continuum um, of reliance upon secondary action representation, the role of action in cognition? Is there a, is there a variation within the population that we can measure and that is going to predict EQ? So um, this is great fun, this sort of research, because you just get to make stuff up. And <laughs> I just sat down and I thought, right, so if we are talking about 
the role of motor cognition in social behaviour, day-to-day behaviour. What is important? What sort of things would you expect? And, um, well, I came up with, actually originally, there was sort of about 30 items. Um, and we did the, we, 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 we um, administered that questionnaire to a large number of people, several hundred people. And what you find is that you find that there's a correlation. You can, um, and you find that only that some of the items, and we came down to 18, all have strong correlations um, with one another. So, No, no, I'm working on a child version now, but this is only to people over the age of 16. Um, we've done this so far. I'm just having a look here. I've put at this original, I mean, so the, orig the first version of the questionnaire um, I published in a paper in uh, Cognitive, Effective and Behavioral Neuroscience. It's freely available online, so you can get the questionnaire if you want. Um, these are the final 18 items. This table actually refers to another study I'm going to tell you about in a bit, which is looking at the effects of autism um, on and, and group differences. But here's the, here's the items, just to illustrate them. And what you'll see is that we came down to a three-factor model in, in, in the second version. Um, this, is, this is the final version. And so we have these feelings items. Uh, I tend to pick up on people's body language, to understand someone, I rely on his or her words rather than the, their expression or gesture. That's a negatively scored item. Um, so there's a number of items here, these ones titled feelings, that are about the perception, how much you, you, how much you use nonverbal behaviour to understand somebody else. So do you tend to try and figure out what somebody is feeling like from what they tell you? Do you rely on listening to their speech and what they say to you? Or do you pick up on their non-verbals? How much do you rely on non-verbals? How much do you rely on verbal behavior? So that's essentially what that one's about. And then we've got here, um, we've got the imagery items. So imagery is tends to sort of how much do you tend to, uh, in my mind, I often see myself doing things. How much do you tend to imagine actions how much do you think about your use? Yes? Um, certainly didn't ignore it. I think the item looking at that um, got, did it get dropped? Because it wasn't, it just wasn't, I mean, I might be the phrase and used it, but it, it, there, there is an item here um, about talking on the phone to somebody. If talking on the phone, I'm sensitive to someone's feelings by the tone of their voice. And that's actually, yeah, and that is, that is treating the tone of somebody's voice as a non-verbal, as, as a non-verbal expression, if you like. Yeah? Um, okay. So we've got feelings, we've got imagery, and then we've got animation. How much uh, music that I like makes me want to dance? Um, if others are dancing, I want to join in. Um, so uh, I get animated when I'm enthusiastic. I move my hands a lot when I speak. So um, that much of how much do you tend to sort of, when there's stuff going on, if other people are moving, how much do you tend to express yourself? Um, how much do you tend to move? Um, and first thing was that we found a very strong correlation with the empathy quotient. So again, there's quite a strong correlation between your use of nonverbal behavior and the EQ. Um, we looked at correlations with, I'll come on to I'll tell you a little bit shortly about our imitation study in the scanner, um, but we had people doing the facial imitation task in the scanner. And we just looked at how much the questionnaire scored, how much people as score on this is a very small scale study, um, but we found that there was uh, correlations with the, between the AFQ score and activity in the somatosensory cortex, uh, the, this, this anterior cingulate here, 
and the insula here. So what, one of the things that came from that was to think, well, actually, what we're measuring in this questionnaire, and partly because it's a self-report measure. So when you're asking somebody to comment on their own use of action, you're actually talking perhaps about action awareness. If you look at somatosensory cortex, if you look at studies, other studies people have done, the somatosensory cortex tends to be uh, active when you're actually paying attention to an action or uh, paying attention to a feeling state rather than uh, actually um, just, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't just correlate with feeling. It tends to correlate with the amount of attention you pay towards it. And then when we looked at this comparison, uh, this is looking at a, uh, the, how much you're familiar with ROC curves, but they're used to measure the value of an instrument in, in diagnosis. Um, I wouldn't use this instrument for diagnosis as such because it's not picking up, it's not asking about the DSM-4 criteria, so it's not asking about diagnostic criteria, but it, you may consider using it as a sort of a marker of autism, and you find that it has very similar properties to the empathy quotient, um, this is the this is the whole uh, the whole AFQ is not so not all that strong. This is the the dotted line here. Uh, the dotted line here is the performance of the EQ, the empathy quotient, and this is the performance of the feelings factor within the AFQ. So those feelings questions um, really show quite high levels. Um, of sensitivity and specificity. So, oh, I was going to have a summary there. Um, so, really, what this study is showing you is that there's a close correspondence between the AFQ score and the EQ score. So, there's a close correspondence between um, your reliance on nonverbal behavior and your, uh, your social skills is, 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 I guess, is the summary, um, summary headline. Um, and again, it shows you really the importance of, um, of simply motor cognition within, in, in determining sort of levels of empathy. Okay, so we're just going to move on. Are we all right? I've got... Um, Okay. Okay. Right. Um, we're going to move on to the third uh, third topic now, which is to go into some of the uh, 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 more brain mechanisms um, that uh, I think are might be important underlying these processes. Um, so, what is imitation? As I've said, imitation is not just blind copying. And um, we need to make a distinction when we're thinking about imitation between uh, blind copying and learning from other people to see how something is done. Imitation forms the basis of culture, but it's, and it's when we copy the behavior of somebody else, we utilize that behavior for some purpose in a meaningful way. That behavior has to have some relevance to us. Um, and we copy it, and so what we need is some understanding of that behaviour. Um, the behaviour requires, so, so when we talk about that, we talk about, you know, understanding. What do we mean by understanding? Uh, we might talk about the attribution of intention. Um, I'm not sure how much you've heard this week about, so in the last couple of weeks, about theory of mind and so on, the idea that you attribute a mental state. Um, and intention, in a way, is very, is, is very simply um, asking about what the next level up of a behaviour is, what's the goal of that behaviour. Um, so every action is embedded, I think after you've had talks along these lines earlier, every action is embedded in a context or some sort of higher goal. Um, this is uh, a photograph of an ape removing a termite from a tree, um, from a hole in a tree using a stick. And, you know, probes the stick in and gets a termite on it to eat it. Um, now, that 
is an imitated behavior, but he hasn't just done it blindly. Oh, clearly the chimp is able to, has been able to see another animal doing that same action and appreciate the link between the action of probing the stick into the hole and obtaining a food reward. So if we think about any sort of action process, we appreciate that there's this layer, this hierarchical structure. So we can start off with the actual kinematic movements in, that are coded in our motor cortex, these different sorts of that, that, that enable you to perform a reach to grasp action to lift over, lift something up. Um, and that in originally has a goal and that has a higher goal. Um, and there might be a higher goal further than that, which is because you want to prepare a snack for somebody else or you want to prepare a snack for yourself. That being the goal of that being to please somebody, that being again to have its higher motives, so on, so on. So we understand that actions are located in these hierarchies. Here's another copy from Kilner and Friston, which I think is again showing the, uh, here's the context, which is the, uh, you're in an operating theatre or you might actually not be in an operating theatre. Um, your intention, you, you, you're going to grasp a scalpel here um, and you could be grasping a scalpel in order to cure somebody because you're doing an operation, you might be going to stab them. Um, you'll attribute, you'll, you'll, you'll probably attribute the intention judging by the context. If you're in the operating theatre and you see the surgeon pick up a scalpel, you don't think that he's actually out there to hurt somebody. So in that sense, the operating theatre will provide you um, with a context in which you can infer an intention. Okay, um, now we are interested then in when we're trying to understand the neural basis for imitation, what we're interested in is how actions are encoded in association with their context or their goal. An action has to be understood in, in those terms. Um, and the well-known, these well-known studies on mirror neurons identified, first of all, um, these neurons which could, would fire when the monkey was observing somebody picking up a raisin, but the very same neuron would fire when they see the raisin being picked up. But what was very interesting in subsequent work was that these, um, they're not just in code, the, the, these neurons were not just specific to the, in fact, the actual, the action, but there was also some specificity in relation to, is this working? Yeah. So in relation to actually what the, what the broader context was. So they, they, here's the monkey picking up something to eat it and seeing something being picked up to eat it or being picked up to place. And you see that the mirror neurons are um, firing more strongly when they map to the context. So this is some evidence that at least the parietal neuro mirror neurons are not only mapping to the actual uh, action, but also corresponding specifically to um, encoding the context of the action. Um, this is a study that Marco Iacoboni published um, in, sci uh, in, in PLOS Biology. Again, he looked at uh, what, whether we have more activity, uh, whether we were encoding the context, were you picking up the cup to drink from it, or were you picking up the cup to clear up? So, you know, here before tea, and then in which case you're probably picking up the cup to drink from it. It's after tea, in which case you're picking up the cup because you're cleaning up. And what you find is that there's an effect, in, in that particular study, there the effect of context um, was found particularly, I'm just going to highlight 
uh, this, this question in the premotor cortex. So what about, how does that correspond to emotion when we try and understand emotional expressions? Well, this is an example of um, somebody, uh, this is taken from uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett's paper, um, looking at the way that we understand emotional expression. Again, you might, what do you think about this guy? Probably think that he looks pretty angry. Um, but he's actually um, rousing the audience. And until you actually see what's going on, um, you, you find actually he's, he's, he's very excited. And in fact, that, that was used, I, I can't remember, it was one of the presidents, one of the presidential candidates lost, the, lost his election um, campaign very much because of something like that, where you, know, you can take a photograph of somebody and put it completely, well, if you remove the context from it, then you can alter its meaning. Um, so here we can see how the context of an emotional expression will be important for you to understand um, its meaning. Okay, um, so slight deviation. So I, we are going to go back to uh, the facial imitation paradigm that I've or sort of told you about, but here we did put people into a scanner to have a look at the neural basis for that facial imitation task. And what we did here was we compared it to um, an instruction condition. So they saw, the first condition, they saw the facial stimuli and were asked to imitate them in the scanner. And in the second condition, they saw an eye or, um, and then they, they, before their face appeared, they either saw an eye um, or an instruction, um, anyway. <laughs> If they, yeah, if they saw an I, they had to imitate it. That's right. And if they saw an O, then they had to make an O with their lips. And if they saw a T, they had to make it stick their tongue out. Um, Event-related desire, about 20 people. And again, we found that the empathy quotient correlated with the error score. And what we found was that the empathy quotient correlated with activity um, again in the dorsal premotor cortex and the somatosensory cortex, um, also the hippocampus and the intraparietal sulcus. So we're finding that the level of activity in the mirror neuron system is correlating with empathy, with, with, with how empathic people are when they're imitating facial expressions. Um, we also looked at where, which brain areas were active during in, 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 and how that correlated with that accuracy, with how, um, so we particularly found once again, a lot of premotor cortex activation um, was correlating with, um, and, and insular activity was correlating with, um, with accuracy. Um, where we looked for, where we found an overlap was again in dorsal premotor cortex. So here we're finding activity in the dorsal premotor cortex is correlating both with activity and with accuracy. So that particular area seems to be the important area that's mediating um, the, the, the relationship. Probably not the only area, but it's the area that's mo most robustly uh, mediating the relationship between empathy and accuracy. And that maps onto this sort of Jacoboni idea that this is the area where we're shown the understanding of the emotion. Um, and what I say is, I mean, essentially, my conclusion is that the, the, that finding is a number of studies show that it's not when we when when you look at the literature on empathy and the and, and the neuropsychology of it. Um, say you'd look at most of the current reviews, they say, well, actually, if you look at the mirror neuron system is not involved in empathic function. Empathy, empathic function is mainly dependent on the cingulate and the insula. Um, and that's where, and there's some supplementary motor cortex, but they're not really arguing 
for a role in the mirror neuron system. Um, that's because if you're looking, that's that sort of within subject, looking at an empathy task which is not motorically based. But what I'm saying here is, it, and, and a, the number of studies saying, well, look at variability of empathic traits in a population of individuals. And then what we're saying is that if you look at variants of empathic traits across many people, then you do. You find that grey matter volume of the mirror neuron system, you find that uh, degree of pain sensitivity towards others. Um, you find the differences then begin to map onto the mirror neuron system. There's quite a, uh, a number of studies. So it's really a question of individual differences. Okay, so I think we're at the summary points. Um, just to go over the sorts of things that we've just been talking about over the last hour. So primarily autism is a developmental disorder characterized by a specific impairment of learning to use actions with meaning. If you talk about the diagnosis of autism, that's where we started. And we're concerned with the use of actions with meaning. The self-reported sensitivity to actions with meaning is highly predictive of both empathic traits and autism diagnosis. Um, Imitation impairment in autism is well established, but we can now say that we've shown that that's a specific imitation impairment. Um, we also show that Im emotional imitation accuracy correlates with empathic traits, and we've shown that emotional imitation is impaired in autism. Um, imitation requires an intentional understanding and Empathy requires an intentional attribution to emotional expression. We note that the mirror neuron system encodes intention um, and the empathic traits correlate with mirror neuron system activity during emotional imitation. And we're, so again, just to clarify, we're talking about individual differences here. Okay, so... Um, I was going to, can probably draw to a close, really, um, just think about the future, where, where, where we're going to um, now. Um, as I say, I mean, that's just sort of emphasising that point, that I'm talking about uh, individual variability in mirror neuron system activity. Um, where are we going uh, now? I haven't talked at all about the predictive coding account. I think you've probably been talking enough about that all week, and it's not really my speciality. Um, the important thing about the mirror neuron system is that we don't see a, a sort of completely feed-forward model. We're not talking about just impacts of up, feed up, feed-forward processes of visual information coming in onto the, onto the motor system. We're talking about backwards effects of how the motor system affects the perception of action and that that's a whole uh, feed-forward and feedback mechanism. But I think you guys are probably more experts here than I am uh, in that. Um, one of the things that we're interested in is the imitation and other measures of social cognition. So, um, as I said earlier on, very interested in why does our facial imitation measure uh, correlate with empathy? Um, there's many reasons why it shouldn't, like, for example, the absence of context in our task. Um, so we're very interested at the moment in further exploring these current links. And what about links with, with emotional contagion and mimicry, that influence of emotion on your emotional state? How much an emotion perception evokes that emotional feeling in you? How does that link to imitation? And secondly, we really haven't quite pinned down yet why that imitation link, what's, what actually is the neural basis for that autism impairment. Um, so, um, happy then to uh, thank you for your attention and open it up to discussion.
Right, from the summary points, uh, I, I take it that you are saying to imply, uh, implying that there is no motivational deficit in autism, but only the lacking means uh, to express your social uh, motivation. Is that correct? Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'm, I don't know if I said that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I. I, I think autism is an, is a developmental um process i mean and and I'm, i i would probably argue that the motivational aspects will affect the learning aspects autism is always going to be a can't do or won't do issue is it is it that you can't do it or is it that you won't do it and um in fact i mean i no, i mean i certainly wouldn't have intended to say that because i've got some other data which would argue that, in fact, the, the, and in fact the, the reward circuitry is very, obviously, because, you know, with, with in terms of operant conditioning, reward circuitry is very closely tied to goal-directed action uh, mechanisms, right? So any goal-directed action is attached to the reward circuitry. If the reward circuitry for social actions is not working very well, then the social actions won't develop. Uh, I think that's very variable. Some people, yes, and they become very depressed. You see some particularly higher-functioning people who become very depressed with, as, as a result of their difficulties in social interactions, and others who are more than happy to be left alone and please just leave me alone and stop telling me to get friends. I don't want friends, right? <laughs> Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I, have, I have two questions. The first question is about the meta-analysis that you showed in the beginning um, regarding that imitation <laughs> is a deficit in autism. I thought I saw that the I square statistics were around 78.8% and that shows that the studies were very heterogeneous. Uh, how can you say that? Um, the I oh, you mean the meta-analysis? Yes. Yes. You're saying the case? Mm. I square statistics were around 78%, so it means that the studies were very heterogeneous? I mean, they will be. They are. Okay. They certainly are. I mean, they're very much in agreement. As I say, nearly every study has found there's a deficit of imitation. Um, and they, they're, I mean, the, the, the heterogeneous in terms of some of the, they go from you know completely very learning disabled young children through to most not many with adults some with adults normally high functioning adults so a very wide range across the population now nearly every study if you use age matched and IQ matched controls then you find a group difference okay um, I thought that the level of aut uh, autism was different among the participants in different studies that would have affected it, but it's okay. Well, it's the, when you talk about the level of autism, there's two issues. One is the severity of autism as measured by the numbers of the amount of autistic symptoms, if you yes. like, so say the ADOS score. ESD. Or you might think about the level of functioning in terms of is this somebody who's, I mean, if you look at their, their IQ, you know, they might be low IQ and very impaired. Um, as opposed to quite high functioning. So. And my second question is that um, you in your summary mentioned that emotional imitation is impaired in autism. Um, I have read some studies about autism and I understood that fear perception, uh, like emotional perception in people is mainly through the whiteness of the eyes. If you show someone the, uh, only the eyes and not the face, they can easily perceive what emotion you are describing. And uh, it is well established that uh, people with autism have uh, abnormal eye contact and difficulty in gaze processing and understanding. And there was this... Uh, Sorry, sir, again? People with... Uh, can, I take, can I take one question at a time? Because I lose track. Oh, sorry. So the first question was about... Um, no, no, I am I'm building up the question slowly. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> it's that um, the whiteness of the eyes uh, is an important factor for understanding the emotion. 
and uh, people with autism have difficulty in uh, having a direct gaze perception. They can't have good eye contact. And uh, the thing is, um, there was an interest interesting study in McMaster University in Canada where they inverted the face and they found that the fear perception and uh, perception of anger was enhanced uh, in people with autism when they inverted the face upside down. Mm. So, um, I think that uh, this, stu this study has not been replicated many times, but I think that uh, emotional imitation, emotional perception is fine in people with autism. It's just that the dysfunction in mirror neuron system affects uh, the way yeah. how we see it. Okay, I mean, so that was what I was saying, was actually, you do find, if you look across studies, there is a weak effect of emotional recognition. There's a small effect. You have to have a big study. Um, and you do find that there is some weakness of emotional perception, but it's not very much. Um, the, the people tend to, I mean, in reality, the eye contact thing is not very reliable because people with autism had often been taught and told, you must look people in the eye, and they've been taught from an early age. And so what, you actually, what we actually talk about is the ability to regulate eye contact. So somebody will tend to... Somebody with autism can often do the opposite. They may avoid your gaze, but they may stare at you. And you'll find it quite uncomfortable because they can just sit and um, fixate on your face and not regulate that eye contact. So that's one of the things. Um, yeah, I mean, I totally agree about looking, you know, is the whites of their eyes. If you do the reading of the, uh, called the, the reading the mind in the eyes task, it's off widely available, Simon Baron Cohen's task. Now, I can get 100% on that using an algorithm that I've figured. You just look at how wide the eyes are, you look at the eyebrow position, you look at whether the gaze is direct or averted, you, know, you have a knowledge of the vocabulary, you can solve it. It's Yeah, I just wondered if you could say a bit more about why you think the difficulties with facial imitation go together with their empathy performance. So is it the case that um, facial imitation requires some kind of understanding of intention so that you know, the reason that you're seeing these two things going together is because you know, that's impaired in both cases, or you know, why, why do you think that they, they go together? Um, my present hypothesis, um, I, I, I'm, I, that, what my original idea was that it was, it was a question of whether or not you could attribute the emotion and you, you, would, you, you, you read the emotion in the face um, in some sort of simulation, imagining the emotional state. Um, I'm not that. I'm, I'm. I'm still trying to figure it out, and I, I, I can't. I can't give you a sign. Yeah, you know, I can't give you a conclusion yet. I think we're working on it, but I suspect it. But what the other thing we're looking at is, um, I mean, it's a question of granularity. So, yeah. So Lisa Feldman Barrett has introduced the concept of granularity in in in, in terms of as a verbal measure of emotional. So what's your emotional vocabulary like? I'm trying, interested in granularity as a motor skill. If you think of your facial expression and your capacity for emotional expression as a motor skill, how good are you at doing it? And if you look at the, the nature of the actions of feelings, questionnaires and social behaviour, it's a question of how much is your motor skill actually developed? How much have you spent your life honing we do it unconsciously. I'm not saying none of us, I don't, well, there might be people here who use a mirror every day and make faces in it, but most of us don't. Most of us only look in the mirror and see what we look like. We don't practice our facial expressions. But we do every day get this sort of unconscious feedback. We're always honing the way that we express our facial expressions to people. It's part of our social behaviour. So I think that it's about training. Um, that's my the current awareness and the more you've trained, the more you've been interested in it, the more sociable you are, then the, it's mapping onto that. 
But what's that got to do with empathy now? Uh, the the question about how how well you w the way that we understand each other. So this whole there's this whole field, um, if you like, called embodied cognition. I think you've probably heard some quite a bit, and you're doing quite a lot about embodied cognition these weeks. It's the way that you understand other people, the way that you understand other feelings, is through a sensory motor process. You perceive... Now, we're not talking about whether you can or cannot perceive other people's feelings. We're talking about how well you can perceive other people's feelings. How, what a, how fine is your understanding of somebody else's emotional state? And you can think of it in verbal terms, is how many different words you've got to describe somebody else's feeling state, and that's what writers do. But we can think of it as a motor skill in how well, how fine we can appreciate somebody's, um, somebody's emotional state. When we watch TV, I, if you're a big movie fan, I love movies, and a really good actor really pins down a facial expression. And they know the context, they can manage that. They, they can capture something with an eye movement. They can capture something with a glance. And then we as an audience get it. Not always. I mean, again, so there's a skill both in the expression of it and in the perception of it. Uh, yeah, I'd like to continue Julian's question, but um, perhaps uh, starting uh, <laughs> from scratch. So you started your, your talk saying that... Um, no, uh, but it's, very, it's stimulated by Julian's question. You started your talk saying that people have studied mostly from a cognitive perspective and that you want to go into more an affective perspective. And I really sympathize with this idea that to say, okay, the problem might not be so much, we can all say not so much sensory motor, not so much mirror neuron per se, but more the affective state of the individual. Um, but I see that you still like to hold on to the mirror neuron notion and that empathy is directly related to this. Uh, I would put something on the table, that which I did not study myself, um, but to say, no, actually the problem is more at the interoceptive level. So that they don't, they are just really motivated differently. And so this interoceptive thing, which is closely related to empathy, so, uh, like you're saying yourself, eh, so they might not have the desire to have friends. They might not have the desire to really understand why somebody else is doing it. Because their body, eh, I, I see interceptive system as signals from the body, is just telling them there are, there are other priorities. And so it might not be so much in the, in the mirror neuron system only, but more really like in the person themselves or herself, uh, saying that, okay, I want to know more about this and this, which is not correlated <laughs> to what other people might get kind of signals. So what would you see about this? So like putting empathy not only in relation to the mirror neuron system, but more to the affective state of the individual. Okay. It's awfully difficult to summarize it all, isn't it? Let's say things um, briefly. Um, I think when I talk about the mirror neuron system, for me, that is, is um, I'm using that as an abbreviation, and I'm r including probably in that the insula and the somatosensory cortex, so those feeling states which are coming through, we say the interoceptive processes. Um, and we're talking about, I, 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 and essentially I suppose I'm also saying, I think the cognitive versus emotional distinction is, is, ends up being a very clumsy and not very helpful one, because when you talk about an emotion being encoded Within the somatic, within the interoceptive, you know, within the insula and within the somatosensory cortex, is that a cognitive or an emotional representation? Um, it doesn't, you know. So we 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 need to try and dissolve those barriers. I think. I mean, I agree. There's a there's an issue about there's a distinction between the encoding of a feeling state in the somatosensory cortex and insula, which might be distinct from the reward learning mechanism in the orbital frontal cortex. So perhaps we can make that distinction, um, separate the motivational state, but otherwise I think we're in quite, we get into difficult territory using old language. In the second part of your talk, you emphasize that imitation requires intentional understanding. 
The, in the first part, however, the tests, for example, the triangle copying task, you analyze pass lengths, which is pretty close to blind copying because it's not what's happening in that task. And similarly, the facial expression reproduction was without context. So the subjects did not know, is he smiling happily to because he's watching a comedy, having a nice conversation, or smiling because he's in solitude. And the stimuli actually matched precisely the later example where the interpretation of anger changed with the rally of the democratic politician. Um, and so far, I'm right now confused how the data of the first part relate to the claim that it's about the understanding of what's going on. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I'm not even. I'm not going to try. So you're absolutely right. Um, it's not, it's it's it's. I, I agree. I mean, I think we, I, you know, we, we evolve our experimental. I'm presenting data that is, you know, collected over a long period of time. Um, I definitely would agree that my experimental design, you, the, the harder, the, the, you know, the more uh, constrained you make your experiment, and this is always the problem in, in autism research, you end up, you constrain your experiment to make it work in the laboratory, and you take out the stuff that you wish you hadn't later. Later on, you go, I didn't really, that, that, I've missed that, the key variable here. And I think that many of my experiments have got those, I think you, you, you highlight the limitations. Um, they have generated some very interesting data. Um, and so I present the data that, they present, that, 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 that they've come up, but I, I agree. And the facial imitation one, I was wondering if anybody would pick up on on that, it's nice to see you're listening, um, because exactly, you know, there is no context, and I wonder about using a context, but I think that probably um, what's happening is that when you do the task, you use the same cognitive emotional processes you would do if there was a context. So what we're finding in the fMRI study is, no, there is no context, there should be, but you're still using the same systems in doing it. Okay. Thank you.